I was thrilled that when our church staff uh, decided to have this series on sex and bodies and marriage and sex, that, that they invited me to be part of this because, <laughs> as you know from my time as your pastor, I'm an expert on all of that. <laughs> but then Heather thought better of it and said, uh, you know, considering your situation, why don't we uh, let the younger staff deal with the sex and the bodies. Uh, you deal with Paul on passing away. <laughs> so, doesn't that sound just like Heather? And so, uh, she has assigned me my scripture for today on passing away. Now, let, let me put today's scripture in context. Paul has been in the middle of a sermon series at First Church Corinth. And he's been talking about marriage, and he's been talking about family and bodies. And strangely, in the middle of this sermon series, Paul just lurches into this apocalyptic discourse, this eschatological thinking uh, about the time being short and the world ending. Here, our scripture uh, for today. Uh, I mean, brothers and sisters, the appointed time has grown very short. From now on, let those who have wives be as they had none, and those who mourn as though they were not mourning, and those who rejoice as though they were not rejoicing, and those who buy as though they had no possessions, and those who deal with the world as though they had no dealings with the world. For the present form of this world is passing away. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Uh, time is short. This world is passing away. Paul makes a very strange statement. I want those who have wives to act as if they didn't. Now in a previous congregation I had a number of middle-aged men doing just that. And uh, that's ugly. And are you happy? Mourn. Do you have a lot of possessions? Act as if you were broke. Are you employed? Act as if you're unemployed. You got a family? Act as if you don't have a family because the time is passing away. The time is growing short. We're close to the end. Now, talk of this kind is called eschatology. It comes from the Greek word meaning last words, last things. Eschatology. Boys and girls, can you say eschatology? And that's a, that's a fancy divinity school kind of word for talk about the end. And uh, I know you, uh, you're, you like to think of yourselves as an educated, sophisticated congregation and you get all twitchy and nervous when the talk turns eschatological. This kind of apocalyptic, eschatological kind of talk we, we generally leave for those uh, yokels that read the left-behind books and stuff like that. No, even though we're sitting in a 19th century building, we like to think of ourselves as a 21st century cutting-edge kind of church, and we don't talk like this very often. What we talk about, what we come to church for, is uh, not to speculate on the future and the end of the world. We come talking about the present. How can we use religion to help work the present better to our advantage? How can we tune up our family life and, and, and make a little better our marriages? Because frankly, the world as it is, is functioning fairly well uh, to our advantage. And so you don't hear much talk like Paul is talking here in this eschatology. Paul says, if you're uh, happy, grieve. Uh, if, if you've got a family, uh, live as, as if you didn't. And Paul is saying that this whole world is now 
because of Jesus Christ, it's topsy-turvy, flipped on its head, everything up for grabs, changed. And, and we think of kind of our religion as kind of ways that we better adjust to the present, not as we speculate on the future. But even for accommodated, well-adjusted people like us, there are moments. Uh, I had a man in one of my <clears throat> previous congregations, and, uh, well, he wasn't very much in the congregation. See, he was very successful, very busy, too busy for church. He had started a business from scratch, this multi-million dollar corporation. They had built a big building, corporate headquarters. Well, one morning he was walking into the building that he had built and suddenly he had a massive heart attack. He fell down on the sidewalk there. Fortunately, EMS got him in time, got him to the hospital, resuscitated him. And I visited him over the next few weeks. Even though I didn't know him that well, I visited him because I'm such a conscientious pastor. And uh, when he got out of the hospital, I was surprised he was back at church the very next Sunday. Huh. And I said, wow, I'm glad I'm such a good pastor and visited him there in the hospital. Look at that. He's back at church. And he said to me as he walked out the door, hey, thanks for your visit. Uh, I want you to know, though, I'm not the same man you knew two weeks ago. All right? Huh? Everything's changed since you first knew me. And I said, well, I very much enjoyed our conversations while you were in the hospital. He said, that had nothing to do with it. <laughs> now, I tell you what, when I was lying on that sidewalk, my chest hurting like hell, and I saw my life pass before me, and suddenly, that big building and my job and all my achievements, it was like dust. And when I came to in the hospital, I had to blink my eyes because I wasn't living in the same world. And a lot of stuff I thought was so important was nothing. And preacher, I tell you, beginning of the day, I've doubled what I'm giving to the church. And I want to talk to you sometime next week about ways we can improve our charitable work here and our mission work. And I can do better because I'm not the same. I'm telling you, something a lot like that happened to Paul. On the Damascus Road, know that story where he was met by the risen Christ? Paul was blinded by the light. And when he opened his eyes a few days later, he wasn't living in the same world anymore. A lot of the things that he cared about, like saving, making the world safe for God, and, and all, that was over. It was like he had died. In fact, later in his letters, when he describes what happened to him when he met Jesus, it's like Paul doesn't know whether to describe that as birth or death. It sort of felt like both at the same time. Paul had, it, it wasn't just that his sins had been forgiven, it was that his whole world had been rocked, flipped on its head. And now you can see Paul in his letters going back through every human institution, every human concern, whether it be the government or marriage or family, everything, and looking at it now that Jesus Christ was Lord and, and reviewing the whole thing. When, when Paul talks eschatological, he's not so much speculating on the end of the world and the future. He's making a claim about the present, about here and now. Just for this morning, think of this, that the main difference between a Christian and a non-Christian is that, in a sense, we're living in different worlds. Uh, it's just that we've been let in on a secret of who's in charge, who sits on the throne, where this whole thing is headed. To be a Christian is, is sort of like being let in on the last act 
of the plague. You know where all this is headed, and that makes a big difference. Your world has been flipped on its head. And sometimes when Christians talk, their talk sounds kind of weird, kind of topsy-turvy. Uh, because, in a sense, we know something about what's what, what's really real. So that when everybody else in Durham is grinning and talking about what a great place this is, it's possible that some of you grieve. You see what's wrong. And maybe when everybody else is feeling a sense of relinquishment, everything is dying, let's all have a funeral, maybe you are rejoicing that something is being born. One of you, after one of our Interfaith Housing Network weeks, when we hosted three families without housing here in our church for the week, one of you was telling me in the hallway out here about a conversation you had with a woman, a mother of three. And that woman told you about her defeats, <clears throat> about the way that she had tried to climb out of the spiral of poverty and it failed, about all of the problems that she had had. And you said all you could do was you put your arm around her and you said, listen to me, God did not do this. God did not create this economy. We did. God did not create Durham. We did. And the only thing I've got to say to you is, there's going to be a day when God is going to get what God wants. I love you when you talk eschatological. <laughs> this, so thus Paul could say a rather absurd statement. I want those of you who are married now to, to act like uh, everything's up for grabs, and, and you're not. Uh, and I wonder if this has something to say to us, like, Maybe some of us are having difficulty in our marriages. Not because we don't believe in marriage, and not because we don't put a lot into marriage, but we believe absurd things about marriage. We think that you can put all your eggs into that basket. We're thinking that that's all that God requires. What if marriage is symbiotic on other commitments? I tell you, I've seen young couples having difficulty in marriage and one of the problems is they got nothing better to do than to be married. And they're trying to get all of their fulfillment and, and, and everything uh, uh, from, from the two of them and it just won't bear the weight. Uh, it, it is perfectly normal and natural to love your family. It is perfectly normal to to put uh, everything into kind of your relationship to another person in marriage. But uh, maybe, maybe even something as good as marriage is not the main thing. Maybe Paul is not saying, hey, uh, we're against the family. Maybe Paul is saying the church has got a bigger notion of family than what you define as family. Most of us, our sense of responsibility ends with our kith and our kin. Uh, to quote the great theologian, Chris Rock, uh, <laughs> he was on a rant about people bragging about, oh, I would do anything for my children, I'd do anything for my children. And <clears throat> Chris said, hey, that's your job. Don't brag about it. You're not doing anything special. More miraculous is for somebody walking around in America today to feel some shred of responsibility for somebody beyond marriage and family. I'm proud, for instance, that we got a great youth program that Gare is leading. I'm proud that we're providing that for our youth. But I am more proud that last year uh, a third, half of the youth group were not our children. They weren't our youth. 
They came from other places. Thus, historian Lovett Weems says that in the first hundred years of Methodism, Methodists built institutions like children's homes and uh, uh, homes for the aging, 200 universities and colleges for other people's children. And that in our second century, we mainly served our own children. And the results in the Methodist Church are all around us. Paul says, I want to blow your mind just a minute. I want to expand your world view. I want to give you a, a sense that you were made for more even than something as good as marriage and the family. I want you to just for an hour on Sunday morning turn to a person next to you that is a perfect stranger and say, brother, sister, uh, that's, that's Paul talking about the end. These old arrangements are passing away. Uh, I've, uh, I saw this TV show called Flip This House. And some people fix up an old house, and then they flip it uh, for a profit. And none of you need to watch this show except for the Bradleys. And uh, anyway, uh, so they flip this house. And uh, I, I got one good line from that show with his contractor standing in front of this dilapidated house. And he said, you know, the main thing in this business is you cannot look at a house as it is. You got to look at that house as with a little imagination, it could be. Maybe that's one reason you come to church, is you come to kind of flip your world. You, you come to kind of expand your view. You come to look at people that you didn't even know as family. You, you come to flip this world. And what a gift to get to release your tight grip on the status quo. What a gift to, to be able to get to live beyond the merely present and to wonder, I wonder what God is doing in the world today to get this world a little closer to what God had in mind when God started this off. I wonder how God is using me to expand the kingdom of God. Back when I was chaplain at Duke, I got to meet a young woman first week of her freshman year, and we met off and on during her first year, and she really hated Duke. She, she said at university, so everybody here is on the make, everybody here is ambitious and, and stuck up, and she didn't like it at all, and she decided to leave after her first year. I suggested, why don't you just take a little time off, take a year, get an internship, she did that. She got an internship with Habitat for Humanity. Our church participates in Habitat. And she went to America's Georgia and spent a year as a college intern with Habitat for Humanity. Well, she came back her sophomore year. And so I took her out to lunch uh, first week and I said, hey, you know, you, you look different. And she said, I am different. And uh, she said, you know, uh, I got down there to America's Georgia and I found out it's not me that's crazy, it's Duke that's crazy. And said, I met some of the coolest people. There are about 20 college interns down there and, and they were amazing. And I said, uh, well, well, tell me about your life down there at Habitat. It obviously made an impression on you. And she said, well, first of all, there's nothing to do at night in America's Georgia. It's nothing. <laughs> and said it was nothing to do but said, uh, the students would all get together and uh, we'd get a couple of cases of beer and we'd sing gospel songs by guitar and that was all there was to do. And so I kind of flippantly said, uh, uh, what is this, uh, Millard Fuller, founder of Habitat. Uh, I said, Millard, uh, doesn't like uh, people to have a good time. Uh, I, 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 did, did he not mind you drinking beer in the evenings? And said, no, no, he didn't mind that. Uh, but he told us at the orientation, we've got one rule, and that is you cannot have sex with the staff. 
And I said, oh, well, he's a Baptist and, you know, they don't like people to have a good time. <laughs> and uh, she said, no, that, that wasn't the reason. And I said, well, what was the reason that they, and, and he said to us, he said, if you want to have sex with staff, tell me, I'm a preacher, I can marry you right now. But if you do that, we'll send you home if you're not married. And I said, well, what, what was his rationale for that rule? And he said, and, and she said to me, Millard said, uh, you know, there's too many Americans without adequate housing for you people to be wasting time. 